Hey everyone, it's Brandy and you're watching Abstract Crafter. Today's video is a continuation on from yesterday's video and we're working on this wonderful Halloween haunted house from Evershine. So, if you need a little buddy again today to help keep you company while you do whatever it is that you are doing, then go grab your stuff and let's get started after we roll those intro credits. Hello friends, welcome back. If you're brand new and this is the first video you've ever seen from me, welcome. I don't often say this, but I want to try to remind you guys once a week if you're not subscribed. It would mean the absolute world to me if you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Like the video, share with your friends. Just all of that kind of stuff really helps me. Thumbs up, comments, all that. I love it. Give it to me. I can not get enough. So, we're working on this Evershine haunted house that I got. And all the relevant information pertaining to that will be in the video from yesterday. I will link that up in the eye for you. So, go check that out. If you want to know more about this, there will be a picture up there also for you to see what it is we're working on. Uh, it's a very small one. It's the smallest of my Halloween paintings that I have. So, probably from here on out, we'll be working on... Halloween. Um, also, if you missed yesterday's video, I have put away my custom for a little while while I decide what it is that I want to do with it. So we're going to jump right in. I realized in the last four videos I have explained what the emotion story guide is and I don't want to explain it again. I have explained it enough and hopefully you've seen at least one of the last four videos Drill with me videos, I should say, and where it was explained. If not, then I guess you'll have to go watch those videos to know what I'm talking about. If you don't really care that much, then I guess you'll just listen to me talk. So, let's see. I don't want to dawdle. That's not the right word. That's not the right word. I don't want to prolong it. We'll just go there. And I want to get right into talking about some stories. Um, I do know that I try... I, some of these I'm trying not to talk about my recovery story so much unless it's something I can talk about without, you know, having to give you a bunch of context behind it. But I do think I want to talk about the moment when I felt weakest and strongest because it has a lot to do with my mental health in conjunction with... Um, my addiction that I went through. My addiction that I went through. That sounds so weird. You get it. You know what I mean. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I need to go grab a drink. Because I forgot to. And my mouth is just dry from the last video. I've been just trying to get cram as much filming in as I possibly can. As much as my phone will allow. So I'm going to pause. Ooh, you almost... Said it, I'm trying not to say you won't even notice because it's so annoying and it's played out. But you won't notice. So I don't know why I always tell you that I'm going to pause and take a break. I should just do it and see how smoothly it goes next time. So that's what I'm going to do. But I will be right back. I mean, like I said, you won't notice. Shut up, Brandy. Oh my God, shut up. <laughs> so I think... For today's Drill With Me, I do want to do the Scared and Brave. Because I find that I'm scared all too often and brave not often enough. I have a plethora of stories to tell you about being scared. A few to tell you about being brave. But I think for me being scared, it's not like you would typically think. It's not like horror movie scared kind of thing. It's more like everything in the world scares me. If I think too much about it, I can't watch like apocalyptic movies. I can't watch like any like kind of horror movies whatsoever. I can't anything like that. I find but then even in real life like if they're 
somebody has done something wrong to me, said something wrong to me, made me angry in any way, I I always want to say something, but I feel blocked. It's like a, a wall literally goes up into my throat and prevents words from coming out of my mouth. I, it's, I hate it, and I admire anybody who has the courage to speak their mind, even sometimes when it can be quite annoying. I still admire that because I, I just can't do it. I don't know. I just, I, I just clam right up. But I do have a story, and it's kind of more lighthearted. But that's because the ones that are terrifying deserve more than I can give you in a half hour clip. So this one happens. Okay. So I'll set the scene. I, one of my close girlfriends had, what, had moved away when I was like 14 years old. And then she had moved back and in my adult years and we had started reconnecting and at the time I had just had my daughter Haley I think she was maybe a year old when this story is going to take place it was just before I met my husband but um yeah so it was just before I met my husband I don't know what the butt was for I really don't know where I was going with that so anyway uh one of the ways that we like to reconnect was, or we like to reconnect, one of the ways that we like to spend time reconnecting is by, even late at night, even 8 o'clock at night, getting together and having coffee. We used to love, there's this creamer at the time. I don't even remember what kind of creamer it was, but it was this, we drink this amazing blueberry coffee and this specific kind of creamer and they don't make it anymore it was long ago discontinued which is why I can't remember the name of it because my daughter is now 16 so this was about 15 years ago and we'd play cards some nights we'd play canasta some nights we'd play skipbo it just depended on what we were in the mood for how long I had to hang out and that kind of stuff so uh, we would do this every night and our daughters would sit and play together, and she had a daughter about the same age, so it was just an amazing time in our both of our lives. You know, we were young mothers. Gavin at the time was probably four or five, but he liked to stay home because even at that time we lived with my parents, and at, my mom and dad were still a couple at this point. They had divorced by the time I had my third son, uh, which is not an important part of the story. But he really liked to stay home with my dad. And they would have little wrestling matches before bedtime and stuff. It was just the cutest little relationship they had. They they didn't call each other, like, he didn't call him grandpa. He called him buddy. And my dad did the same. He called my son buddy. They were each other's buddy. And so he preferred that to hanging out with me, falling asleep at my friend's house, and then having to get loaded in the car. It was easier with my daughter because she was still kind of a baby. <laughs> I was young and stupid. I would have never thought to do that nowadays with my kids. But you know, back then it was, a, I didn't have somebody to watch her all the time. And she had fun playing with my friend's daughter. They like even had their own little language. One day we walked in and they were just baby babbling. Like, my daughter would babble something, and her daughter would respond. It was the craziest thing. And it made absolutely no sense. It was literally gibberish. But they had their own little baby babble language. And so it was all fun. You know, it was fun times for all of us. And on this particular night, we started to get a big storm. Like a blizzard. Not just like a little snowstorm, but like an actual blizzard. And growing up in... in upper Wisconsin you kind of learn to drive in snow because it happens so often that it can't be avoided so I was also having weird car troubles at this time where I needed to constantly 
like put oil in my car. I had just like a slow leak. And I hadn't, I was, I was so young and I didn't really have money at that time to fix it. And so I just put oil in it whenever I could or whenever it needed it. And so occasionally I would forget to latch my hood all the way because the latch was kind of broken. So we're just making a bad situation worse. And not to mention that I lived in one town and she lived in the next town over and the only way to get to the other town is to go over these bridges that go across Lake Superior there if I can find a picture I'll insert it here so you can see what I'm talking about uh, I'm pretty sure I can I mean I live in this town so there should be plenty of pictures I might even have some in my own library but you you had to drive over these bridges well like I said you have to be experienced or you're pretty ex you are pretty experienced you don't have to be you just kind of are not I guess not everybody it's like everybody forgets how to drive in the snow when it first starts happening but we are well into winter at this point and so I wasn't afraid to drive in it I just knew I needed to take it slow uh, going over the bridge I knew would be fine because during snowstorms nobody else is gonna be stupid enough to drive over a bridge so this is where the scary part comes in I kind of debated about actually sorry I had like an air block in my throat for a second there not a burp just like air got trapped in there um so I kind of debated back and forth about going it didn't seem like it was too bad but boy by the time I get to the top of this bridge would I realize how wrong I really was and <sighs> I don't know, like, I used to have no problems driving over the bridge until my son was born, and then all of a sudden, it was the scariest thing in the world to draw, drive back and forth across these bridges, whether I was driving or not, and it took years for me to overcome the fear enough to drive myself over it. I would literally tuck into a little ball and curl up and just, like, put my head between my knees and my hands over my ears whenever anybody drove over it, because I was so terrified of this bridge for some reason. And at this time, I was just kind of starting to get over it when I was dr started driving back and forth to my friend's house. So, I'm trying to find the letter U really quick while I'm telling you this stuff. Oh, here we go. Um, so, I lived about two blocks away from the foot of this bridge, and she lived about five minutes on the other side. Like, when you got across the bridge, it was only like a five-minute drive to her house. So, I thought, well, this isn't bad. We can do this. Um, let's go. So I strap my daughter up. I get her all put into her little suit, her little snow suit in case something happened. Because like I said, I had a crap car and if we broke down and I needed to wait for somebody, I wanted to make sure she'd be nice and warm and bundled. So we start driving over the bridge and the roads aren't plowed yet, but there's tracks like car tracks from other cars that had traveled before me so there were grooves to you know get across the bridge and all of a sudden I get to the very top of this bridge which is for me to this day the most terrifying part of this bridge I still don't like if there's construction up there and I get stuck up there which has happened where traffic is moving going from 55 miles an hour to 5 miles an hour because it's a construction zone and only one lane is open instead of two. So, anyway, I, uh, I get to the top of this bridge and all of a sudden I hear this big BAM and my hood flew open and whipped and it like hit my windshield. And of course the wind was blowing against us so once a little bit of wind got under that latch, it just threw the hood open. And there has been a multitude of accidents on this bridge. Like there was a horrible story of a, a guy that lost his ladder on the top of the bridge. And when he went out to go retrieve it, unfortunately was struck by a car and thrown over. Now this bridge is so high and the lake is so... Uh, violent underneath it that 
you don't, that's the uh, survivability is, it's never happened. Um, let's just put it that way. And so that's all I could think about when this happened was, because it had, I think it had happened not long. Like, I think it was that summer that accident had happened with this poor man trying to retrieve his ladder and getting struck. And so that's all I could think about was, oh my God. And we were in the inside lane, thankfully, because I don't travel the outside lane. There's like a cement barrier and that's it. There's not like a huge wall to protect anybody from anything. So I had no choice but to try to pull over as far over as I could, whip on my ha hazards. And then when I stepped out of the car, it was up to my knees. The snow was already up to my knees. And when I had left, it was not even close to that, or I would have never thought to drive. It In that two block period and halfway up, it had intensified so much that I was now standing in snow up to my knees. With snow drifts, I should say. They're very different. Lake effect snow is insane. If you've never experienced it, you should look it up. Because it's crazy. It's like ten times what any of the surrounding area would get. I mean, that might be an exaggeration, but it sure feels like it. So, I'm out trudging along, trying to get through this knee-deep snow to get to the front of my car to shut the hood... And it's locked. It like it does not want to come loose. And so I'm in full blown panic mode. The whole event probably only took about maybe two minutes from the time that I pulled over and got out to actually getting to the front of the car and shutting the hood. But it felt like we were up there for like fifteen, twenty minutes. It, it I was terrified. Luckily there was no traffic at all. Nobody had even drove by me or I think I probably would I probably honestly would have soiled myself like no joke and so I fight with the hood a little bit to get it shut and there is no way to turn around and go back home without going traveling the whole length of the bridge horseshoeing at the end of the highway a little bit and then getting back on that bridge and going back over so I just went to my friend's house and waited it out a little bit until the storm settled down. Thankfully, by the time I left her house, it had stopped snowing completely, or at least down to a light drizzle. Who can say? It, all I know is that I made it home without incident, and I made it to her house without incident. But I tell you, I've never been so terrified in my entire life having to get out of my car on the top of this bridge and in the center no less where there is nowhere for me to jump if a car did come or hit my car and not only that but my my one-year-old daughter is strapped in the car seat in the back and if I could have ran I would have ran I couldn't run that's all I could do is just I went as fast as I possibly could but that was probably one of the most scary moments I've ever had in my entire life was when that happened. And needless to say, I also learned a lesson in not letting things go. And I got the car fixed like the next week. I My dad is a mechanic. So I just, I begged him to fix it and told him I'd pay him back. I just could not deal with that again. And I ended up having to get a new hood because it was so badly damaged from the wind throwing it back the way it did. I don't know how strong those winds were, but they were awful. They must have been awful strong to damage my car in the way that they did. So, yes, that was the absolute scariest time in my entire life. And now, uh, let me see how much time. Okay, we're good. we got at least 10 minutes. Probably more like 15, but... So I think the time that I felt the most brave, I have two stories for it. One might not be like the best example to be sharing, but I'm going to share it anyway because they both center around the same thing in domestic abuse. So uh, the first story is kind of quick, I guess. Um, I may have mentioned it in 
one of my longer drill with me videos about I think it was the second part and why I left the diamond painting community I had touched on the fact that I was with a very abusive boyfriend and the day that I went and put a restraining order on him was one of the days that I felt the absolute most brave and this is why so I, I don't think I told that story completely but what had happened was that I was at my friend's house and I had a little Dodge Omni at the time, which is, if anybody doesn't know, it's like a little, it's a little two-door car with a hatchback and no real, I mean, there is a back seat, but it was at the time, okay, well, let's just not jump ahead. So I was, at, I was visiting my friend and I was getting ready to leave with him and my son at the time was not even a year old. He was just a itty bitty baby, a couple months old. And we were there visiting my friend and he also, his dad also was, he was the one that was very abusive, um, physically abusive. And he happened to also stop by because he, they were a mutual friend, which was an interesting situation to be a part of having mutual friends with somebody that you had such a disastrous relationship with and an even more disastrous breakup. And so... He gets there and I decide to leave. I kind of play it off so that he doesn't think I'm leaving because of him. And I put my son, I was in such a rush to get out of there. I was not thinking and this is very unsafe. And I know this to this day, but at the time I wasn't just, I just wanted to get out. So I, I strapped him in his car seat in the front. I still had him in backwards, though that's not any better. And no, it's not my most proud moment as a parent but we all make mistakes as a parent and that's not really the point of the story to dwell on but it is a part of the story because it plays into the fact of it of everything so for some reason he still gets really upset that I'm leaving and kind of he's not stupid he knows no matter what I said he knew that I was leaving because he was there and so I don't know what it was that triggered him or what it was that was actually said to this day because it, my adrenaline was going. I was It was such a rush. So I get my son in. I close the door. And before I can get in all the way and shut the door, he jumps in my the passenger side. I hadn't even had a chance to lock it. He jumps in the passenger side and is leaning over my son. And I'm screaming at him to get out. And he is trying to take my keys out of the ignition. I'm trying to start it and just drive away because I didn't care if he was hanging out of my window or not. Because I think that's how it was. I don't think he was actually in the car at, at this point yet. I think he was leaning in and trying to prevent me. Like I'd go to start the car up and he'd put his hand there or he'd pull the keys out. I can't remember exactly how uh, the finer details to this point my son's 20 now so this was 20 years ago I'm telling you some old stories today so I know this is gonna sound like the scared story but I it's not I promise you it's it's the good story so one thing leads to another and he's not having any luck getting my keys away but he had managed, I think, to knock them out of my hands enough to where they fell on the floor or maybe he got them out and I needed to, either way, it took my attention away from what he was actually doing. And so either way, when he became unsuccessful at that, he actually started trying to unbuckle my son from his car seat and take the car, um, the car seat out with my son in it. And so I start at first I was obviously trying to fight him off of the car seat to get him from taking him. Because I knew that, that if he would have got a hold of him, that would have just been so much worse for both of us. Things w would not have ended well. It would have just been disastrous. And so I stopped focusing on him long enough to get the car started. And I don't know how it worked out this way, but it did. I got the car started. I was able to pull away and... I'm thinking that he must have been hanging out the window because I would have never drove away with the car door open with my son strapped in his car seat. 
I know for a fact that no matter what, I would have not have been that unsafe. Even though I just told you a story about taking my daughter out in a blizzard, that was a different situation altogether. Um, that was just a bad judgment call on the weather. This was literally a life or death situation that I was trying to escape. Like I said, uh, it would have been very bad if he would have accomplished either goal of either getting my keys or getting my son. One of the two. It would have just... I don't know what could have happened. I don't even like to think about what could have happened. But somebody was certainly looking down on me this day and protecting me because I was able to get the keys in and start the engine and pull away. And I just remember seeing him in my rear view mirror. I was hyperventilating. I was crying to the point where I almost couldn't see out of the window and I didn't even hesitate. It was about a 10 minute drive to the courthouse and I drove right there and that day I put a restraining order on him and up until this point I had been very resistant against doing that and they ended up directing me to this wonderful organization called CASDA Center Against Domestic Abuse and they helped me finish the paperwork and get me a lawyer and do all the things I needed to do to get a restraining order and that is one of the days that I felt the most brave is the day that I was smart enough to realize that it wasn't about just me anymore, that I had another little life to take care of and he was a priority over me. And as much as I, for some stupid reason, still felt like I loved this guy, which looking back now, it was not love. That There's a whole other name for whatever that was, and but it was not love because that is not what love looks like. Love does not hurt you in that way love does not abuse you and torture you and hit you and manipulate you and lie to you it doesn't no matter what anybody says it, it's it, no or no matter what anybody feels if that's not what love looks like i know what love looks like now and that's why i can say with full confidence that what i thought i had that was not love that was a something else entirely but you know I felt so brave getting myself out of that situation and finally coming to the realization that I didn't deserve that and that I deserved better it, it my friends had told me all along to get out of it my parents had told me all along to get out of it and I didn't listen to anybody until it came to him bringing my son into it I never up until that point ever thought my son was in danger and the moment that I thought that he was I did what I had to do to make sure that he was protected and I to this day that is probably one of my most brave moments and the second part to that is I'll try to tell it really fast because we're running out of time for this clip my friend that I told you about with my daughter she had when she first moved back she had moved from Alabama where she was staying with this guy that was at the time I didn't know this but he was incredibly abusive to her well eventually this guy ended up following her and moving here and well he ended up being homeless for a very long time but I remember one day we were supposed to go to lunch and where my house was at the time before my the last house I lived in it was across the street from this giant park that was the size of a city block and I was parked in this driveway or like parking lot across from this park because there was also a community center like across the street at, on one of the sides of the park and I was parked in the parking lot there because she said she needed to go talk to this guy really quick. And um, then we we're going to go to lunch. But she needed to just talk to him and let him know that that's what was happening. Well, I could tell that he didn't like that idea. And that the, you know, by this time I did know that he was abusing her. Or had abused her pretty violently, in fact. And uh, so I, I, my hackles were up a little bit when I saw that they started arguing she has a little bit of a hot temper herself, so I knew that the potential for that to escalate was rapidly approaching. And I am watching, and I see her start walking 
toward my car. Oh, I'm like, great. So it's done. She told him she's going to lunch. He's just going to let her go. And then all of a sudden he turns around and grabs her, throws him. And she's a short girl, like four feet something. I'm five, five. And she's, I think four, just under five feet, like four, eight, four, nine. So she, she's a short little gal. It's, it was no big deal for him to just scoop her up and throw her over his shoulder, like an old gym towel or something. But right there, I'm like, uh-uh, this is not happening. I went into protective mode. I was like, nope, nope, nope. I knew she didn't want to be in the situation. I wouldn't usually involve myself unless I felt like the person could not get out of it. Um, or if I actually physically saw him hit her or something. You know, which in this case was as close as you can get to it by him grabbing her against her will and throwing him over her shoulder and starting to go in the opposite direction, I could then tell he did not want her to end that conversation. So I went over and I got in the middle of it. For some reason, he was afraid of little old me. I don't know why, but he was. And he, uh, I went over and I grabbed her by her hand and I said, come on, we're going to lunch. I looked at the guy and I said, she will be back in a little while, and he's following us all the way, arguing with her and whatever it was. I don't remember the exact argument to this day, but he's following her and arguing with her, and I, she gets it, she's finally able to get in the car, and just before I jump in, she got in before me, and I turned around, and I looked at him, and I told him off. Obviously, I don't remember the exact words, but I told him off, told him to get the hell out of there, he uh, tried to jump in behind my car, and I backed up. I didn't hit him. I bumped him, not, like, to hurt him at all. Like, I, no matter how much I hate a person or how angry I am with them or how much of a POS I think they are, I'm. I, that's not me. I cannot be that person, especially when I've been hurt the way I had been. And I, I just bumped him a little bit, and we took we took off. That's the part where I think you might not be so proud of me, but I knew she was in need to get out of that situation, and all I could think of is, let's go, let's get her out of this situation, let's eliminate the source of her, ang her anxiety, her pain, her anguish, let's just go and do lunch, like we said, and maybe when we see him again, he will have calmed down. And he even said that I, you know, I actually did think I hit him at the time, but he said I didn't. He's the one who said I didn't. And he actually understood. I would not understood, but, you know, he let it go. He didn't, like, dwell on it. So that was another time I felt brave because I stood up for somebody that was in a situation that I had just recently gotten myself out of. And I was very proud of myself for doing what I needed to do and feeling brave and getting somebody out of a very bad situation. Uh, it's not the best story, but they kind of went hand in hand. And those were two times when I felt the most brave. And I know that, like I said, that that story may not have been the best explanation of being brave, but all I could think of at the time was I needed to save my friend, that my friend was being that my friend was in a situation that I could tell that was obvious she did not want to be a part of. She was trying to get away from. He was not letting her. I know how dangerous it w could have been for me to get involved, but I guess my thoughts didn't go there. I mean, t now I can, looking back, hindsight, I know that that was stupid to get involved and to step into such a dangerous situation, but... I didn't think like that. I just thought I needed to get her out. I needed to help her because I could tell, like I said, that she wanted out. Uh, I would have never liked somebody to take me out of a situation before. Like when I was in my bad relationship, I never liked anybody to get involved. So I knew it was a risk I was taking and that she could possibly get mad. But when I saw that she was trying to get away and he wouldn't let her, that's when... My adrenaline kicked in, and I just reacted. I didn't think I reacted. 
uh, I'm a lot smarter and a lot braver, or a lot braver. I'm a lot smarter now, and I can read situations a little bit better. I don't react with my feelings anymore. That, like I said, that was that was probably about eh, 19 years ago, 20 years ago. It was shortly after I had gotten myself out of my bad relationship. So, of course, I was feeling myself. I was all thinking I was some kind of crusader against abusers. <laughs> Not the way to go about it. Not at all. I lesson learned. But either way, I wanted to share with you whether, you know, that's kind of the point of doing this is... Some things aren't going to make me look the best. And some things are going to be an opportunity for me to brag about myself a little bit. That is a story that I may not look the best. Either situation, really. But it's me. It's who I am. It's all a part of what has shaped me to be who I am. So, was it stupid to do, get involved in that way? Yes. Do I regret it? Absolutely not. I saved my friend that day. That's That's all I know. And that's all she knows. And she has told me that, you know, that she was scared for her life that day. So ultimately it worked out. It could have been worse in so many ways. But thankfully it wasn't. But with that, I'm going to let you go. There should be a part two or a part three at least. Maybe a part four. We'll see. We'll see how I'm doing, how my battery's doing, all that fun stuff. But... With that, I'm going to let you go. Have an awesome day. Have fun doing whatever it is that makes you truly happy. I love you, friends, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.